Welcome to E-Commerce with Coffee, a podcast powered by Amber Engine, where we share e-com secrets for brands over your favorite brew. We start with the caffeine and then leap enthusiastically into behind the scenes e-com insights that led to the success of our guests. I'm Nate Svoboda, and I'm about to serve you up the best. Let's get started. All right. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Good, Nate. How are you doing today? I am doing fantastic. Thank you. Um, so for our listeners, we've got Brian Beck on the call today uh, for our next episode of e-commerce with coffee. Um, Brian authored the billion dollar B2B e-commerce, and he has had a, uh, a very, very expansive career. If you're holding the book up now, there we go. Um, I've had an expansive career in the world of, of you know both B2B and B2B C, B2C e-commerce. So really, really excited for the conversation today. And you know, would love if you could just give us the highlights of you know what got you to where you are today. Wow. Uh, well, Nate, uh, you know, when I first started, th- thank, number one, thanks for having me, by the way. Um, and uh, yes, I, d- I did write that book. <laughs> the, uh, so, you know, when I, uh, when I first started my career, Nate, and this just makes me old, there really wasn't much of an internet. This is uh, my first job. I had a computer on my desk with no internet. So this is, uh, we're going back to the 1990s. Ancient oh history. <laughs> no, what is that? <laughs> So no, I, I've been, but I've been in, so I've been in the e-commerce field for 20, 22 years since the late 1990s, believe it or not. So I've lived through all kinds of things. Uh, you know, the, the original, the dot-com boom and bust, and uh, I got involved in it by, way back when I worked for AT&T in New Jersey, uh, where I grew up. And uh, we were, we were doing all this at the time. You had to have like big broadband pipes to get any kind of speed on your internet. So you know, it, AT&T was, was coming up with all these sort of walled gardens. You remember AOL? You know what that is? Oh, yeah. Okay. Just making sure. So <laughs> it's before your time, I think. Um, so at the time, it was all these closed, you know, walled gardens and such. And AT&T was, you know, of course, had all this infrastructure. And so they were getting into trying to figure out how to do, you know, internet commerce, e-commerce, et cetera, back in the late 1990s, believe it or not. So anyway, I got involved in it then. I got hooked. And I haven't looked back. I spent my whole career now in e-commerce. Um, so I've run companies, run their e-commerce divisions at big companies, and I've done startups. I've done all really the whole the whole nine yards. Learned a lot of, along the way. Failed Great. quite a few times and had and some you, success too. And you, and obviously, uh, you wrote this book to help these businesses, these B two B commerce businesses, you know, capitalize on the changes that are coming. Right, the uh, the convergence of B two B and B two C those worlds. What was the hardest part about writing the book for you? <laughs> That's uh, writing the book. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, I, when I started, so take you back, Nate, a little bit. You know, I spent 17 years as a, a B2C e-commerce executive, right? So I was running e-commerce in consumer segments. I ran it for Harbor Freight Tools, for PacSun, Pacific Summer, California, you know, r- you know, real consumer brands. And what I loved about the B2C side or B2B side was that, you know, when I started getting into it about five years ago, it's where consumer was. 15 years ago. And that was so much of the same kind of opportunity now for B2B companies. So I I started writing articles about B2B, Nate. I started writing, you know, just what I was seeing and uh, publishing them on LinkedIn. We're going back about five years. I said, you know, I should put these into a book. (laughs) Well, that uh, that was five years ago. Uh, And so the hardest part about writing a book is, is really just, it's not the ideas. It's just taking the, finding the time to write it down. And I wrote it myself. I, I hired a, uh, a publisher to help me, but an editor to help me, but it was, I wrote the content, um, the vast majority of it. And it's just, it's just the time when you have a day job, right. To, uh, to, to be doing, uh, to be doing writing, but you know, it's 400 pages long, it's 12 chapters and it's a play by play guide for manufacturers and distributors and B2B e-commerce. So it's been well received. It's exciting now that it's in the market. Came out oh, last absolutely, year. and you've been uh, and you've been doing a lot of uh, conversations with people talking about it over the past couple over the past couple of months, close to a year, I guess at this point, right? Yeah, been about it, almost a year ago it was published, and uh, yeah, it's you know it's it's fascinating. And, you know, the neat thing too, Nate, about it is it's not you know it's it's all over the world. Companies trying to figure this out. I, you know, I have a client in Helsinki, Finland. I had a company that I worked with earlier in the year in Japan. In Germany, I mean, all over the world, companies trying to figure out how do they embrace digital commerce for their B two B business, and and it's uh, 
and it's exciting. So yeah, it's yeah. Been, a, been a blessing. Well, I'm really, really excited to, to talk to you today. And I have a bunch of questions I'm really, really excited to get your thoughts on. But before I do, I see you're drinking coffee. I can only imagine, given how busy of a guy you are, caffeine has got to play some type of a role in your in your day to day. What's a role? Yes, it's my it's my life juice. <laughs> I, I probably drink six cups, seven cups a day. So yeah, I I I have a, a, a some folks I worked with back, um, and you can, those of you listening on the podcast can hear my beans shaking here. Um, about um, two years ago, a couple of friends of mine started a coffee company, and uh, if you go to simplifyhealthyliving.com, that's their that's their website, and this is wonderful coffee out of. Uh, Ethiopia and it's a company the the brand of the coffee is called Kafa and it's uh, I, I love it it's it's not too acidic but it's yet it's strong I need strong coffee Nate how about you what do you like to drink you know I've really gotten on a, a cold brew kick recently so okay. I don't have a bean grinder I do there's nothing better than fresh ground coffee um, but I've just got my uh, my Pike Place Starbucks uh, grounds going with some cold brew there you go that cold brew sometimes I go black sometimes I go a little bit of cream in it but usually just kind of yeah. whatever whatever gets me going in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> really awesome. Well, you know, Brian, I guess jumping right into it, you know, as we're talking about this convergence, right, of B2B and B2C, has B2B e-commerce seen similar changes to those that everyone is talking about in B2C e-commerce? And, you know, what are those changes? Yeah. So, well, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, B2B is really where B2C was, you know, 15 years ago, which is one of the reasons it's a little nostalgic for me in some ways. <laughs> But, you know, one of the things that, um, <clears throat> that that's happening in the B2B market is that the buyers, the same buyers that are that are um, using e-commerce for their personal lives are now expecting that from the suppliers they deal with in their business lives. So you have this whole, you know, you call it, quote unquote, consumerization of B2B, right? But there's also differences, right? So, you know, when you think about a B, B2B e-commerce, so I define it for everyone is a business buying from another business using e-commerce channels. And if you're a consumer listening to this, you might you know, think, okay, Amazon. Yeah, that's kind of the idea, right? So in B2C or in B2B e-commerce, there's commonalities related to you know, ease of finding products, shopping and going browsing through categories of products, seeing, this is a, this is a concept for many B2B companies, new concept, product images of your products on the product page. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of common elements, including checkout, right? There's so fast and easy checkout, but there's also a lot of differences too between B2B and B2C commerce, Nate. I mean, you know, if you think about the B2B customer, first and foremost, they're doing a job. So the key is, is to get, to make it really efficient, get out of the way of the buyer, let them number one, find what they need really fast, but you also need to accommodate things that are unique to B2B. You know, buying um, buying on on payment terms, credit terms. You know, B two B companies often extend credit terms to their buyers and let them pay over 60, 90, 120 days, whatever. So, credit terms. Also, pricing. Your pricing, if I'm a business buyer, might be very different than uh, someone other another customers. So, many of these B two B companies that sell through e commerce need to support many price books, many different versions of the price on the same product, because they have contracts. The buyer and the seller have a contract. That dictates price. So, you know, there's there's similarities and there's differences, but at the end of the day, it's it's there's there's just a lot of commonality, which is why when I came into the field after 17 years of a B2C e-commerce work, you know, a lot of the what I saw wrong with B2B at the time and wasn't happening was accommodating those traditional B2C like features on the website. So too many companies putting up, you know, a, a plug into their ERP system. Uh, with no pictures, no images, no easy checkout, no way to find anything unless you knew the SKU number or part number. So when you do this, though, when a B2B company does this right, the ROI is incredible. Um, and it's really transformative in ways that even B2C companies don't see. So it's, it's fascinating. There's similarities and differences. And, and I, you know, that was actually going to be the next question is what are some of those things that are still unique? You already touched on that for me, but really curious to know, are the, we talked about ROI a little bit. You just touched on that. Are the most important KPIs for B2B brands online the same as those for the B2C brands, or is there a difference there? Well, there's, there's, they are somewhat the same, and they're also different. So when you look at, again, just my, to my last question, my last answer, right? Um, you know, the, the KPIs, when you think about 
the most common KPI you hear in consumer e-commerce, and if your listeners are, you know, familiar with e-commerce in general, they might know conversion rate, right? Conversion rate is the most sort of com- one of the most common things you hear. Well, conversion rate in a B- that's the number of people that buy when they come to your website, right? It's it's a percentage. And in the consumer world, if you're getting three four percent conversion rate on your website, a, a retailer. If I had that at Harbor Freight or PacSun or wherever I was running e-com, I was thrilled. In the B two B world, that conversion rate still applies, but the but the rate of buying is much higher because there's a higher intention to purchase when someone visits a B2B e-commerce site. So 10, 15, 20, 25, 30% conversion rates are not unheard of in B2B. The metrics the same, the measure is different. Number of customers, much usually much greater in, in consumer e-commerce. In B2B e-commerce, smaller universe of buyers, but they buy more frequently and they buy they buy um you know and, and they have a high intention of purchasing when they come to your e-com site so kpi one conversion two you hear about things in b2b that actually are um that, that are more important than in b2c share of wallet how much of that customer that business's share of wallet do i am i getting and can i increase it by using e-commerce because i'm making the buyer's job easier and i'm presenting them with products they didn't know i carried you know, one of the things, Nate, about these these businesses is some some of these B two B companies, particularly distributors, have hundreds of thousands, in some cases, millions of products. When you talk about things like machine learning and intelligent search, um, surfacing product at the right time for that customer when they're buying, it, you can apply these same uh, principles from B two C around AI and artificial intelligence, smart search, present the product at the right time to that business buyer. They're more likely to buy it, and you're 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 increasing share of wallet, so incrementally, uh, you know, greater impact for some of these tools in B two B. So there's there's differences and there's similarities. So you know, you, you hear about conversion rate, your share of wallet, more of a B two B term. You have others too, average order value, others that you know come into play in, in both both sectors. But you know, there are definitely differences. No, that's that's absolutely fair. Now, you know, Brian, in B2B, right, the traditional consumers are, are actually other businesses, right? I mean, it's it's fairly yeah. explanatory in the name. You know, but a lot of these businesses also sell directly to consumers. So how does a manufacturer avoid channel conflict with these traditional channels when they're launching their own e-commerce? <laughs> well, that's that's one of the biggest uh topics right now, Nate, um, in um in B2B, particularly manu- you know, to your point, manufacturers. So, you know, when you think about the sources of channel conflict, um, I think I have this concept in my book, right, um, which I stole from Jim Collins. You ever read Good to Great? You know that book? I can't say that I have. It's a great book. All right. You have to read it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a classic. It's a, a business staple, I think. Good to Great, Jim Collins. One of the concepts he has in there, and when he measured the performance of the top um, performing top performing companies in the industry as, as, as measured by market cap, market value, he found commonalities in some, some behaviors and, and, and how they did things. And one of the key things he found was that they confronted the reality of their situation. He called it the brutal reality of their situation. And the brutal reality is for many B2B companies and branded manufacturers is that the channels they're selling into are changing. And what I mean by that is the distributor the traditional distributor or retailer they sell to may be losing relevance with the buyer, the ultimate buyer. In many cases, they are. Just look at all the, for example, the retail bankruptcies that are going on. Shifts are happening. A lot of that volume is going to Amazon. It's going to other places. It's going to peer play distributors. It's going. So number one is that you have to recognize that's happening and understand it. what's happening in your industry. So as a brand and manufacturer, you got to go all the way to the what I call the ultimate customer in the book. I have this, this, it's one of my subjects of one of my chapters, understand what they're doing, how they're buying and the value that traditional distributor and retailers adding to that customer and recognize that, that in many cases that value is fading. So channel conflict to your question, where does it coming from? Well, the, the traditional distributor or, or retailer is gonna push back if you try to sell direct, right? They're gonna say, whoa, you can't do that. But I argue that manufacturers have to uh, because they have to get closer to the end customer and you can manage it through careful pricing programs. You can set, there's ways to set your um, retail through MAP policies, minimum advertised price, distribution agreements, and you look at your assortment strategically. So you, maybe you're not selling all the same products to that ultimate customer, that end customer. Um, 
that you are through distribution channels. So there's some ways to mitigate channel conflict, but too often I hear companies using channel conflict as a reason not to engage. And I think that's a losing strategy. I think at the end of the day, 10 years from now, manufacturers who are not paying attention to what's happening with that ultimate customer are at risk of, of losing relevancy to that to that customer. Their distributors go out of business or go away and you're, you're in a world of hurt. Your business has declined. So anyway, no, that's absolutely. my thought. <laughs> no, absolutely. Now, and you, you touched on Amazon a little bit, right? And I mean, Amazon, uh, Amazon business has become, you know, a, a fairly well-known household name or business hold name, I guess, over the past year, a couple of years. You know, obviously they've been a major force in B2C e-commerce for years. Is it as pervasive in the world of B2B and how should a brand approach engaging with Amazon? Yeah, great question. So um, one of the businesses that I'm own and I'm involved with is called Enciba. And um, in Siba, we manage um, B2 programs for mainly for B2B manufacturers of uh, products that are selling to other businesses. So I spend a lot of time with Amazon business. We uh, know and understand and, and a lot of the folks there um, and kind of what's driving that. So Amazon business has become the fastest growing part of Amazon, period. It, it eclipsed Amazon Web Services last year in terms of growth rate. They did $25 billion in B2B transactions last year. They're expected to do over $70 billion in, in the next, uh, by 2025, I think is the, is the date. So Amazon has become one of the world's largest distributors of B2B. So it's not a matter of, you know, when are they going to arrive? They're already here. <laughs> and if you look at the, if you look at the categories where they're generating revenue, you know, people have this misconception, oh, it's just, you know, notebooks and paper, uh-uh you know, $2 billion in medical and dental products in 2019, two years ago. So, you know, there, there's, um, there's a lot of uh, momentum they have across categories. And if you look at the distribution, so there's a company called Applico, which does these studies and they look at the number of products that Amazon has versus the big distributors, Fastenal, MSC, Motion Industries, Cardinal Health, Medline, all these big B2B distributors. Amazon has more product more breadth of product than, than, than many of them do. In some cases, four to five times. That's a traditional way that businesses compete in the distribution, B2B distribution category. And Amazon is beating them at their game. So what, is it, what does this mean? It means that the, you know, the same dynamics we've seen in, in consumer, where Amazon is now 50% of consumer e-commerce volume in the United States, that's coming, that's coming to B2B. And frankly, they're they're already on, they're way way on uh, down the path. They are they are five times the size of Granger. They will be. In oh my goodness! Yeah. So if that you know that's that's insane. So they're they're a machine, and they're and they're and they're a significant player in B two B, and many companies don't realize it. So how? But then and and I. I don't believe this necessarily was touched on specifically. So how should a brand go oh, about engaging with the marketplace or approaching Amazon? Yeah, keep me on track here, man. <laughs> I tend to get on my soapbox and keep going. So what have brands um, done in the past and, and what is the situation today and how do they take control of it or optimize it? So what happens is many companies today, many brands have found they don't they're in no, they have no control over Amazon. They go on to Amazon, they search their brand name or their product category, and they see, they see competitors there. They don't, they don't know who they are. They, you know, there's companies that they've never heard of uh, selling in their product category. They've got sellers. They don't know who they are selling their products. They, we did a survey and Siba did last year where we surveyed several hundred manufacturers. And we said, we asked them, number one, are your products on Amazon? And 70% said, oh yeah, they're on Amazon. Okay. And I said, the second question was, how many of you know all the sellers selling your products on Amazon? 70% said, we don't know who they are, right? So, you know, it's, it's a situation where brands don't have number one control. So the foundational thing that brands have to do is to take control. How do you do that? Well, you need to start on, in several ways. Number one, oftentimes these companies are selling to Amazon, meaning in a, what's called a vendor central approach which really hands all the control over to Amazon. That's not a way to maintain control. Now we know it's, I know it's comfortable for everybody in the brand side. You've done it for years. You sold on a PO for years to everybody else, Home Depot, Lowe's, Motion Industries, et cetera. But you know, you have to change your approach if you're gonna gain control. So number one, 
look at a shift away from Vendor Central to something called Seller Central, which is a different way to sell on Amazon. That's one path you can choose. The other path that some companies are choo choosing, Panasonic did this recently. They gave all of their Amazon business to one of their big distributors. And, and, they, and, and the key here is to maintain control of your resale market, your brand, and to have some things in place like map policies and distribution agreements as well on the back end to control it. But, you know, there's a big, big move, Nate, right now for companies, their brands to shift away from 1P uh, and shift away from this sort of lack of control scenario and gain control. And they do it with 3P uh, and they do it with uh, channel control programs like I was describing so, so yeah, what, yeah, go ahead. So what have been your thoughts recently on Amazon adding the like the brand pages and trying to give more control and, and ownership of the of their customers back to the brands? Yeah, I would say um, I say Amazon is responding to. Um, so Amazon's realized a couple things. First, that the marketplace or third party model, you hear Bezos talk about it. Um, you know, that that is a that's a model which is he said kicking the butt of, you know, one peak. Amazon itself is moving more, uh, more towards a 3P enablement model for uh, brands versus the traditional 1P retail model. More of the volume on Amazon is coming from third-party sellers than is coming from product that Amazon actually owns. So number one, you're seeing that happen as a, as a strategic shift at Amazon. Number two, though, so that's Amazon itself. That's not even brands trying to take control. It's Amazon saying, I, I want to I want to give, you know, I, I, want to, I want more coming from third-party marketplace sellers. The second thing that, that Amazon's done is to allow brands more tools, to give them more tools to tell the brand story. And they're doing that in response to the market saying, I don't want to sell on Amazon because I don't have any control of my brand or my product content. They've introduced brand registry, right? They've introduced enhanced brand content. These are tools Amazon has put out that will that help brands to tell their story in video and pictures and content and copy. If you took the top, take one of these pages, Nate, and you cut the top Amazon bar off. I did this at a, at a talk and I asked, I asked people during, a, uh, I think it was a webinar or something. How many of you think this is an Amazon page? And everyone got it wrong because it doesn't look like Amazon. When you, if you take the Amazon bar across the top of one of the storefront pages on Amazon. And so it's a, you know, it, they're trying to accommodate the brand's, um, um, you know, way of uh, differentiating a way of telling their story. Uh, and, and it's been, I think it's been successful in many ways, but it is still Amazon. <laughs> so no, absolutely. And, you know, I feel like, especially in, in light of what's been going on this past, you know, 14 plus months, I feel like it's self-explanatory, but what's special about the current state of e-commerce that makes it more important for brands to be moving online now? So um, the um, what's more important about e-commerce now in a post COVID world, right? That's the, the, the nut of your question. Well, look, if COVID has taught us nothing else, it's that um, you know we we can adapt um, and are creative, and we and the importance of digital is has been elevated. I mean, the stat that I often cite is that in 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 the first three months of the pandemic, we saw five years or sorry, ten years of acceleration of e-commerce, and I don't think we're I don't think we're going we're going back. Um, and in the B2B world, the thing that's that's really different here is that COVID forced uh, people that were reticent to use e-commerce channels, buyers, uh, it forced them out of their old habits. So, and then they realized that it was actually, it's actually easier and faster in, you know, when they're interacting with suppliers that have done uh, a good job with e-commerce, it's easier and faster to do their jobs, get them done using e-commerce. Therefore, I think I think we've I think we've really accelerated B two B in in ways even beyond what what's happened in consumer e commerce. You have some industries like electrical and traditional industrial categories where the buyers have been they haven't they haven't needed to change they haven't needed to uh, adopt e commerce channels. But at COVID happens, you can't go to the branch, you can't go to you can't buy from the supplier the way you traditionally have by calling the sales rep. You going to e commerce. Uh, and and they've learned that e-commerce is a great a great path to, to to make purchases, so I think it's I think it's forever. Um, it hasn't changed. It's accelerated what's already in place, and I think the the what, the other thing that's dramatic about this Nate is you got suppliers that are uh, buyers that are buying from suppliers they've never bought from before 
the stat is 50% and they're doing it on e-commerce, right? And so, so I think loyalty has also been ch- completely, you know, thrown on its head. You got people buying from new, new places and they're going to, they're going to stay, you know, loyal to those companies that accommodated them because they've discovered it's easier to do business this way. And so anyway, I think, I think you see, you're going to see some long lasting impacts uh, and particularly on the sales force, the traditional uh, B2B sales force, people in the field toting a bag around, right? Yeah, and it's really interesting how, and you just touched on this a second ago, it's interesting how relationship-based selling in the world of B2B has always been. But now, to your point, there's all of these other expectations that they have, consumers or you know, business-to-business consumers have because of the shopping experiences they have in their own life. Now, in your opinion, how much of the value of the move online is about better processes and delivery for brands versus how much of it is about the convenience and enhanced shopping experience for the customers? You know, who benefits the most? Well, I, I, I like to say, if you're doing a good job for the customer, the B2B buyer, the other stuff will come. Um, it's just, it's the Amazon model. I mean, look at, look, at, look at how well they've done by focusing exclusively on the buyer. I mean, to the extent that they, you know, suppliers in the Amazon world are just widgets. They don't, there's no relationship with a, with a supplier in the Amazon world. It's a, it's a algorithmically driven um, uh, situation where everything goes to the buyer. So I say, you know, for B2B companies, for brands, you've got to do the best job for your buyer and accommodate their needs and the other benefits will come. But the other benefits are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, because B2B is so far behind, if you make moves, you know, I'll give you an example, even small companies. So, you know, I have like 35 case studies in my book. One company that I interviewed talked about, this is a dis- small fasteners distributor. Fasteners are, you know, screws, nuts, bolts, and things like that. This is a very commoditized business. They introduced e-commerce about four or five years ago. They took their business, and this is not a big company. This is a $15 million company, okay? This is not a Fortune 20 company. They introduced e-commerce. They enabled a really a, just a fantastic system. It's easy to use. It's like it's, it's easy to find what you need. It's buy, transact easily, multiple ways to buy. You can check out using a credit card or using your account. You can, anyway, it's, it's done right. And it's a small company, right? They... They are now getting 35% of their revenue from e-commerce and they've almost doubled the size of the company and they attribute it to e-commerce in a commodity category. Why is this? So they're, they're up to 25 million plus at this point. Why? Well, they're finding new customers through Google. People are finding them through natural search, other things. Their current customers are expanding their, their, their wallet share with them because it's easier for them to do business with them. And they've reduced their, their volume in their call center because the customers can go online and find out where's my order, do I have it, what's the information I need, everything that the customer in the past would have to call a sales rep for. Just by making the buyer's job easier and exposing their catalog publicly to more people, they've almost doubled the size of the business. And this is not a giant company. So I, you know, that's why I say you're gonna focus on the customer, do a good job accommodating their need and, and, and the rest will come. <laughs> Does it make sense? Oh, absolutely. Do, do the right things and the results will follow. Absolutely. Fair enough. Now, I, I think we, we addressed this a little bit in the ROI conversation about conversion rates, right? But so for, for businesses that are just getting started with e-commerce or just starting to move online, let's say, what are some of the key resources or key pieces of information that they need in order to be able to estimate the ROI that is going to come from their efforts, right? They need to be able to sell this decision to their leadership. How are they going to do that? Well, it's interesting, um, Nate. And so, there's two, I'll answer I'll answer your question in two ways. The first is um, what's hap- what I see happening now, particularly post COVID, and and I just get, I'm getting a lot of get a lot of phone calls, <laughs> a lot of outreach. The leadership at these companies, the CEOs, the um, you know the the boards, are saying um, it's no longer about the business case. It's no longer about the ROI. I mean, it is right. So I'll get to that part of the question, but it's. It, I like to say it's it's now become existential. Like if you don't do this, your customers are going away. <laughs> right? So you've got to do it. It's not about the incremental revenue. It's about existential existence, right? So um, I think number one, what I and, I, and I'm 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 not happy that COVID happened, 
But the fact of the matter is COVID woke up the B2B industry to, to what to the, the urgency, the necessity to just do this, right? So it's not, it's again, so you got one side of it, which is, you know, yeah, you need a business case. You got to understand there's a return. There is a return. We don't need to prove out e-commerce anymore. That all said, e return on investment comes from three things. Number one is incremental revenue. Okay, there's my incremental, <laughs> not just excess, incremental, incremental revenue. And that comes from new customers you're adding, like my distributor example I just gave. Uh, it also comes from increased revenue from your existing customers. So there's there's revenue, um, revenue lift um, and, and some shift. The second part of it comes from imp improvements in your margin. So when companies sell via e-commerce, this sounds crazy, you can charge more. What? You can charge more. Why? Because convenience in B2B equals outweighs price in the equation. When someone calls your sales rep, they're getting a discount when they don't need to. That's this happens all the time. When then and it proves out case after case. I have a whole bunch of case studies about this in the book, where companies that are selling via e-commerce are able to maintain their regular price or even in some cases even charge more, particularly if you're a manufacturer. I have one case study in the book of a paper manufacturer that gets three percent higher gross margin on all of their e-commerce orders on half a billion dollars in sales. Okay. Think about that. 3% on half a billion. That's That goes right to the bottom line. So number number two is this increase in margin, increased profitability. Number three, organizational efficiencies. As an organization, you're going to get more efficiencies. You don't have to, uh, you can repurpose people. You don't have to staff up your call center because a lot of the things that are happening, uh, um, you know, that would traditionally would have happened in the call center are now happening online. Where is my order? I need information about this. Is it in stock? Answering common questions all happens online. And, and so you've got, you've got your revenue lift, you've got your profit lift, and you've got organizational efficiencies. I call it enablement in the book. I have a chapter about ROI. But at the end of the, at the, end of the day, it all starts with understanding what we said earlier, the customer and what they need out of your e-commerce system. So number one, existential. Do your business case, fine, but don't get hung up on it. You got to get beyond the business case and do it. That makes sense. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, even once a brand launches into e-commerce, right, the market's going to continue changing fast. And we've, if we've seen anything from the past year, it can change faster than most people even thought possible. How often should a brand be reassessing their online strategies and, you know, be prepared to change channels potentially? Every day. They have to. This is not a, so that's another thing that, you know, this is the biggest challenge, Nate, I see with B2B companies historically with e-commerce has been a change in mindset, right? B2B is very conservative and they've built companies that are fantastic. You know, I was talking last week, I presented to a C, a C team at a, a huge $15 billion tools manufacturer, the global leader in tools, you know, all their brands and the struggle that they have, they'll remain un, unnamed. <laughs> the struggle they have is that it's it's all it's all about the um, you know kind of alignment and decision making and do we have all the right business cases and look they have awesome product right this is the case with a lot of these B two B companies awesome product it's how they differentiated for years they bring in a market they're very diligent slow methodical makes sense however when you're in an e commerce side of the business you have to be nimble you have to react to data you so. In, in my book, I also have a case study from Corn Ferry. Corn Ferry is a big executive search firm. And they studied these companies that had been successful in e-commerce and digital transformation. They found that the e-commerce leader, the thing that was important for that person was that they could live with ambiguity and make decisions on the fly and be nimble. And the organizations had to give them enough room to do that, right? So we, when we talk about this topic, it's really about freeing, uh, freeing the organization to react to data. And it's not like, hey, I'm putting up my e-com site and I'm done. Uh-uh. This, you know, we learned this a long time ago in the B2C space. You have to react to the data as it comes into you. You have to be okay making decisions with 80% of the information, not 100%. Because in some cases you're going to be wrong. How did Amazon build its business to be as big as it is today? They weren't afraid to fail. They test, they still do this. They test and learn. And uh, I mean, that's where Amazon business came from. From Amazon Supply, Amazon Supply wasn't a success. They re re reformatted it, relaunched it, learned a lot, and now they have now they're having tremendous success. So, my point is, 
to your question, hey, it's about it's about being um, being nimble and it's about reacting and you're and you're never done. It's an ongoing process. So, I mean, I guess the final question that I really have that I, I want to leave our listeners with, and this is not an easy one to answer. So feel free to take a second and think about it. What is the you know, what is the most important or the one piece of advice that you would give to one of our listeners who is, you know, uh, the team member in their organization that's tasked with, you know, getting everyone to buy in on the vision of e-commerce? What is that biggest piece of advice or most valuable piece of advice you'd offer? I think, um, yeah, <laughs> it's because there's so many di- dimensions to it, right? Um, I think the number one thing, if, it depends on who I'm talking to, but if it's someone like you described that's sitting in an organization that is um, um, trying to figure out how they should pursue digital commerce, digital transformation. You have to have leadership alignment and support. And and if you have to make the case for leadership alignment and support, um, and you're not, and and it's and, and you're getting put through a cycle of this business case, that business case. Get me to the describe everything that's going to happen five years from now. Um, you, you should only go so far with that. So if, if I had one piece of advice to the, the person who's doing that, I would say um, you got to really honestly evaluate whether your leadership is serious about this or not. And if they're not, leave, find another job. Sounds crazy, but, <laughs> but I'm serious. And I, and, I, and I say that from a point of somebody who talks to every month, I probably talk to 20 to 30 companies that are in this journey. And the ones I can tell the ones that are going to make it and the ones that aren't are going to have going to have a real hard time. They may not even exist in 10 years. And it comes to what's the leadership saying? What are they, what are they serious about this? Do they know that this is existential? Do they know they have to do it or not? Are they still trying to, you know, prove e-commerce? We have a, I, I do this a thought leadership series called master B2B, right? With uh, Andy Hoare, who's formerly at Forrester. We have a series coming up, a session coming up, all about this topic, which is, you know, is the is the leadership uh, recognizing what's what's happening, and and is and and should they, you know, should do ha, should and how do they invest in it, and, and it's not so much about the uh, it's not so much about the business case, right? It's about it's about you know whether the leadership's commitment is, is there, and so I would say to that person, uh, Nate, that 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 is critical uh, to assess because if you do not have the leadership, you will not succeed. And they don't have to know everything. That's not the point. The point is they have to be willing to act in the face of uncertainty because they don't understand this, a lot of the traditional B2B leaders. Anyway, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the you know, I, I feel like I've, I've read before, right? The, the days of the three to five year strategy are, are kind of going away because organizations need to be nimble enough and agile enough to adapt to these constant changes that are coming to them. You know, uh, so Brian, I guess, tell our listeners where they can get in contact with you and where they can get your book. Well, I'd love to. Thanks for the opportunity, Nate. Um, so you can reach me. Um, well, number one, the book, it's uh, again, it's billion dollar B2B e-commerce. And if you put a dot com at the end of that, you'll see the website and you can buy it uh, through uh, uh, Amazon. I'll take you right to Amazon. You can buy it there. Uh, it, amazing thing. It's printed on, this is a 400 page book, printed on demand all over the world, you can order this thing and you'll have it in two to three days. It's pr- it's made for you. Isn't that crazy? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it's amazing. They're, Amazon amazes me. <laughs> so that's how you can uh, find the book. And if you want to reach me, I'm at Brian, B-R-I-A-N, at Enciba, E-N-C-E-I-B-A dot com. Brian at E-N-C-E-I-B as in boy, A dot com. I'd uh, love to hear from you and talk to, about, talk to you about these issues. This is... Uh, what I live and breathe every day, Nate. Absolutely. Well, Brian, it's been absolutely a pleasure speaking with you. I really, really appreciate the time that you've given us today. Um, and you know, hopefully we can get you on the show again in the future and have further conversations. Awesome. Thanks, Nate. Thanks, Brian. That's it for this episode of e-commerce with coffee powered by Amber engine. If you haven't gotten your fix yet, be sure to get more e-commerce brand secrets on our website at amberengine.com. And don't forget to subscribe for more episodes.